All right, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. This channel is about educational matters. Uh, we have uh, taken some time to review uh, thoroughly a few different theories of everything. And we'll do some more coming up. But right now, we are locked in on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. Mr. Larson was an engineer who lived, uh, born back in 1898, died in 1990. He um, started having his first inklings of uh, the reciprocal system back in the uh, late 20s, early 30s, and uh, took him about th almost 30 years to work it out to the point where he had it boiled down to uh, two fundamental postulates and then he took those postulates and went through a process of deduction okay if this is true then that's true if this is true then that's true um, and he constructed uh, an entire theoretical universe from his uh, postulates and then more or less compared his universe with the universe that the legacy scientists had already constructed and uh, compared and contrasted and critiqued from there and um, came out with some uh, um, fascinating findings. Um, Larson would have been the first to admit that he um, could have got some things wrong what he really said is that the theory itself is correct. Whether I have applied the theory correctly is another matter. So really, like the postulates, those are correct. Um, and there's even some dispute about that. But the first postulate, which is the major postulate, I do believe is also correct. Um, whether he was able to accurately apply the postulates with his deductive process um, also is uh, what he admitted is another matter and some of the people that uh, have followed Larson have uh, objected to certain aspects of um, what he eventually came up with and I, I do think that his method was a little bit flawed also because he, I think he just gave the legacy scientists a little bit too much credit uh, in that uh, what they uh, uh, in some cases he kind of um, accepted what they have already come up with when in some of the cases what they've come up with is just uh, kind of a CYA type of maneuver um, cover up their ignorance um, get, uh, proffering their best guess but pretending like it's solid um, and so uh, Larson, I think, uh, was harmed by the fact that he trusted legacy science uh, a little bit too much. But be that as it may, his basic theory is that we live in a universe of motion. This universe is not made out of matter. It's not made out of energy. It is made out of motion. Motion is the you know the contents of the universe that's what it's made out of and motion is the relationship between space and time so space and time are really the container not the container but the contents of the universe and uh, space and time have a reciprocal relationship meaning that uh, motion is basically a fraction with uh, time or space as the new the numerator and space or time as the denominator. And all forms of motion fit that pattern. All forms of motion are a time-space relationship, such as speed. Speed is the bike is moving 20 miles per hour, 20 miles of space in one hour of time. That is speed, space over time. Acceleration. I dropped the rock out the window and it fell to the ground at 9.8 meters per second. 
squared. That is acceleration. 9.8 meters of space in uh, per second squared. Space over time squared is acceleration. And every other form of uh, scientific quantity also can be boiled down exclusively uh, and specifically to space-time relationships. Now, there are some caveats that Larson talks about in his first postulate. Space and time both have their coordinate aspects, meaning that they can come in three or more dimensions. Coordinate space, XYZ coordinates. Um, time also has their, uh, their similar to XYZ coordinates or analogous to XYZ coordinates. And then there is the clock aspect. Uh, we recognize clock time. Time is always getting later and later and later. It's a progression of time or a flow of time. And that's a scalar motion, a motion that has a magnitude but it has no particular direction. Time flows, but it doesn't really flow in any particular direction. It's just always getting later and later and later. So too with space. Space also flows or progresses. Things are always getting farther and farther and farther apart. Uh, so time and, uh, time and space both have that in common. Uh, also, they are both uh, quantized meaning that they come in only discrete units. There is no continuity of space and time. They come in chunks. And one chunk of space in one chunk of time is the speed of light. And uh, that sets up uh, the speed of light as really what Larson calls unit speed. One over one equals one. And that is, uh, unit speed is the boundary between two separate major sectors of this universe, which Larson calls the material sector and the cosmic sector. The material sector is the one that we're familiar with, the one with the coordinate space and the clock time. Um, but, and this is where the, you know, si legacy scientists have made all their measurements and their calculations and observations. Um, but then there is also the cosmic sector um, that everything is moving faster than the speed of light. And you can see from Einstein's dicta that nothing moves faster than the speed of light, that he knew nothing about the cosmic sector. And the cosmic sector is where we have a coordinate time, three dimensions of time, and progressing space. Space is always getting later, uh, further and farther and farther apart. Um, now the beautiful thing is that you can extrapolate from one sector to the other, but just by sh uh, flipping the roles of space and time. So even though we know nothing about the cosmic sector, we can know something about it by just uh, you know, figuring out what's in the material sector and then just reversing the roles of space and time. So that uh, becomes a powerful tool. There are many other great things about the reciprocal system, but uh, what we're doing right now is we're going over an article that uh, was written by Dr. Bruce Perrette, one of uh, Larson's uh, major revisers, um, who also passed away back in 2020. He wrote uh, many papers under the name Daniel Phoenix Three, and uh, this is the second installment of his anthropology series, The Hidden uh, History of uh, Humans, Homo Sapiens, and um, Perret uses many different, uh, many different things to inform him on his somewhat speculative, uh, you know, hypotheses but he uh, grounds himself in the reciprocal system to a great extent and uh, many, many things in his papers uh, really show you how to use the reciprocal system. Um, and so uh, we are looking at his uh, second, the second article uh, which is um, 
a lot of it is about Project Bluebeam. And uh, we're going to take over right here where uh, he's quoting Serge Monast, who is apparently the first person that really wrote, uh, wrote at a, uh, any length about Project Bluebeam. Okay, so we're going to take over here. As Monast states, enough, enough truth will be foisted upon an unsuspecting world to hook them into the, into the lie. Even the most learned will be deceived. Of course, if you've been reading my other papers, uh, that's the end of the quote. Uh, this is Perret here. Of course, if you've been reading my other papers, you know that the most learned usually have everything backwards. So these new truths will just be an extension of more backwards information to keep the learned experts on television convincing everyone of their truth. At the culmination of the big show in the sky, the projections of Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, Maitreya, um, Maitreya, Drake, and others will all merge into one after the experts, so-called, provide the correct explanation of the mysteries and revelations disclosed so they are interpreted correctly. According to Monast, quote, this one God will, in fact, be the Antichrist, who will explain that the various scriptures have been misunderstood and misinterpreted, and that the religions of old are responsible for turning brother against brother and nation against nation. Therefore, old religions must be abolished to make way for the new age, new world religion, representing the one God, Antichrist, they see before them. As mentioned, a good deception always has a bit of truth. And the truth here is that the scriptures have been misinterpreted deliberately to keep humanity divided and conquered through the artificial boundaries of faith. The deception is that the problem is religion, not the religious leaders. Most religions tell you to love thy neighbor. It's the religious leaders that tell you to murder him. One of the big unknowns is exactly how many people will be suckered into this light show. There has been a lot of science fiction around since the inception of Project Bluebeam, so there may be quite a few people that question the special effects, flooding YouTube with videos of pixel errors on the projected face of God. So there is a backup plan if not enough people buy the company God line. A taste of Armageddon. Those messiahs get revealed as demonic ETs whom, uh, who let loose the dogs of war upon a suspecting people via the use of our own Star Wars program, the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. This was successfully tested on the World Trade Center. But fear not, for out of the ashes will arise a super, super secret government agency, as it does in virtually every sci-fi movie, paid for by trillions of your tax dollars, that has super secret technology that can defeat the rampaging holographic aliens, win the war, and stand ready as heroes so the masses can bow and scrape before them, again as willing slaves. Of course, you only need holographic phasers to defeat holographic aliens, so the technology revealed may also be more of a light show than a reality. This phase of the project has some options. One, people accept the return of the ancient messiahs, 
uh, not likely in industrial societies. Uh, they go through their raptures and become willing slaves to the God-appointed representative in the NWO. Two, the messiahs turn out to be friendly ETs, here to harvest mankind with a mass ascension to higher states of being. They are here to serve man uh, and hand out all sorts of free toys like Star Trek replicators and free energy devices. Three, the messiahs are cast as demonic evil ETs that blast the large cities into ruins and send the people scrambling to the new world order for protection. They have done a good job of setting up their win-win-win scenario. Okay, now this section, section three, called Psychoterrorism, Artificial Thought and Communication. Clearly, psychotronic weapons already exist. Only their capabilities are in doubt. That is not to say that problems do not exist with the weapons and the concepts. At the present time, unpredictable systems failure and difficulty in controlling testing are major weaknesses. Psychotronic weapons are actually biological weapons as they are used to target biological systems in particular, the brain and its software, the mind. The range of concepts is wide. For the Blue Beam applications, the form of psychoterrorism they need is to invoke emotional states that are associated with the archetypal images being projected. Most people will trust their feelings over rational thought. So if God is up there trying to make logical arguments for his existence and return, most people will not believe it. But if they are filled with fear and terror, uh, if they are filled with joy and bliss, or depending on the scenario, fear and terror, they will react before they think and consciously act. Reaction is predictable and programmable. Action, a free will choice, is not predictable or programmable. As to the kind of programmed reaction, Monast continues, quote, Naturally, this superbly staged falsification will result in dissolved social and religious disorder on a grand scale, each nation blaming the other for the deception, setting loose millions of programmed religious fanatics through demonic possession on a scale never witnessed before." End quote. Of course, the sudden unexpected arrival of godlike aliens from a vastly superior world would be quite a shock to human society. So society had to be prepared for such an arrival, even if it was all faked with fancy human technology. In order to do so, new information would have to be presented to civilized man at an early enough age for them to consider it and remain in social media sufficiently long so they uh, teach their young to accept it. This normally requires two generations where the first generation is introduced to the concept gets to live with it for long enough that it becomes safe and mundane, then pass it along to their progeny, who, who accept it as matter of fact. In industrialized countries, the human generation is about 25 years. It takes the time it takes for a newborn to grow up, get fully programmed into society, reproduce, and educate their young. So a proper preparation of this kind of event needs planning and about 50 years to execute. Currently, society is very accepting of aliens and the ET concept because it has been around since the hippie movement in the mid-1960s. Uh, guess what? That's 50 years ago. Society has been fully prepped and is ready to be fully conned. 
The quotation made by Lieutenant Colonel Alexander starting this section was made in 1980. Psychotronic, psychotronic weapons were well underway by then, including synthetic telepathy, the use of transmitters to put voices directly into the heads of unsuspecting people. Curiously enough, the early 1980s was also the start of the channeling craze. No longer the typical uh, mediumship of the earlier years communicating with the spirits of the deceased, but now with a new twist, aliens from outer space, other planets, and other dimensions. Monast's inferences are that all this channeled information purportedly from extraterrestrials is nothing more than propaganda in an attempt to control the spiritual development of man by keeping the God concept externalized. Simply shifted over from the old gods to the new ETs, but still the same group pulling the strings. The development of synthetic telepathy could not have happened at a more opportune time, as it coincided with the recreational drug craze that breaks down many of the mental inhibitions to radical ideas. Or perhaps the drug craze was introduced at the same time to assist in the acceptance of this new form of C3. Regardless of which came first, the result was the same, success. They were able to introduce all sorts of new age concepts into a willing population for an agenda that was planned for execution some half a century later. If anything, the New World Order are patient folks. Okay, that is the end of section three. Uh, we will um, resume tomorrow with the beginning of section four, which is called Universal Supernatural Manifestations via Electronics. And, um, you know, I hope uh, Perrette isn't uh, blackpilling uh, uh, too much here. Um, he, he did kind of have a, a fairly um, blackpilled point of view on uh, the goings-on up until the time that he died. Um, but um, I wouldn't say that that was complete. You know, I wouldn't say he was completely blackpilled, but he just was quite skeptical um, and um, rejected many things that the other people are relying on at this point to, um, y you know, bail us out here. Um, so uh, we'll move on with Dr. Perrette. And um, thank you for tuning in. Have a great day.